So, Berserk is back. It's an interesting addition to the series which we have before us here. At first, I was thinking of posting chapter reactions, but with the fact that this series is now going to be bi-weekly again, which is to say, twice a month, along with the fact that the chapters themselves are largely different from the Berserk of old, I think I'd rather make a video about that. About the new Berserk. One of the key continuations of the story is that this is helmed by Koji Mori, a close friend of Miura who discussed many details over the years and felt that he owed his friendship to get those ideas out to all of his fans. With the assistance that he trained in his final years, contributing the artwork for the series now. We've received two chapters back to back, 365 and 366, totaling 34 new pages with four more chapters to come bi-weekly before we face the end of the current arc and enter the next. There's no indication that there'll be a break at any point here either, but even if there is, six chapters within the space of a little over a year is an impressive turnaround for production time. From this starting point, we already have an interesting tidbit. I believe that the first thing Guts was going to do was to swing his sword, and he does, but oddly enough, they didn't keep the final frame drawn by Miura in the manga. We have the swing itself occur and then conclude in a miss due to Griffith's astral powers, but Miura's panel is not included, which I found really interesting. My first thought was that these chapters cover a lot less plot than when Miura was writing, but actually taking a closer look, it turns out it's the page count. The first chapter, 365, has 19 pages, and the second chapter, 366, has 15 pages. Interestingly, there's also not much dialogue at all, though this might speak to the quotation of Mori, things aren't going to be dragged out, but simply everything that Mori knows is going to be put to the page. Perhaps this is Berserk without forcing a voice in the absence of Miura. It's definitely more than I ever hoped for, but it does result in a very different final product. For example, I think it's a little puzzling when it comes to Griffith. I had a dream under the full moon. I was a child embraced by nostalgic warmth. That too will soon disappear with a single tear like morning dew. That's the first thing he says, and he knows who he's saying it to. Guts obviously doesn't give him much room to talk, but the spacing of the chapters themselves and the decision for paneling ends up focusing on a minutia of the same reaction quite a few times. Guts swings at Griffith and it looks to be a true projection of moonlight, as the moonlight boy's turn over the body draws to a close. I had assumed that what we were seeing was the brief beginning of Griffith's turn, overlapping simply due to the contrast between his own where time lasts longer than the rest of the world. Either way, Guts and the Dragon Slayer don't hurt Griffith whatsoever. If this isn't a moonlight projection, then this is the worst possible news. Guts has elven armor that Skull Knight used to wear, and a sword that has been tempered by the blood of thousands of astral creatures. Then again, Skull Knight, for all his astralness, never actually landed a hit on Griffith either. It was a cool creative choice to shadow Guts' head for a few panels with the rageful one-eyed look. If anything, I'm surprised that the Berserker armor wasn't activated by this rage, at least just yet anyway. And unfortunately enough for Casca, the strength of the brand curse is enough to bring back trauma and excessive bleeding. Casca also has this necklace which breaks, which is really interesting considering we never really got told about it or what it does, but based on the visual storytelling, I suppose it was to amplify a calming state for her, and that's something which is now gone. Shiake witnesses Griffith and is rightfully horrified by his aura alone, though what's interesting to remember is that she's already seen him before, and already knows exactly what he is, so the reaction is interesting. Perhaps the astral nature of Elfhelm amplifies things somewhat, Farnese draws Shiake away from delving too deep, which is a nice touch, and the two re-emerge to find that Casca has fallen unconscious from witnessing Griffith. I think it's completely understandable, but also a bit of a missed opportunity to have her faint here, before she sees Zod, and before any words are shared between these guys. It just seemed like a missed opportunity for the time being. Anyway, we got a slow-mo 35 pages, and that's an interesting thing to think about as well especially when considering the fact that Miura's final chapter moved things along, night and day and night and day again. Here we have a plethora of pages, and we have the outcome we expected, plus the surprise of Zod. Zod being here is an interesting tidbit because obviously Griffith was whisked here alone, naked whilst with Charlotte, transferred because of the full moon and his time being up. So how did Zod get here? Puck sees him come out through the Dragon's Road of the Spirit Tree, but how did he navigate it? There's only two people who can travel there, Sonya and Griffith. And with Griffith travelling via body swap, that means Sonya and potentially hundreds more apostles are waiting to enter momentarily. But to get here, at the very least, Sonya should be there. If that's not the case, we might be in for our first plot hole. 
it'll be very interesting to see how the group interact with this, because with the behaviour of Isidro, Serpico, and even Azan, there's way too much bravado, even just for taking on Zod alone. How he got here, we don't yet really know. We might never know, and I expect we won't be told directly. Either way, the most battle-hungry character in Berserk is here. Where Studio Gaga made two chapters and 35 pages and told us that Guts responds with a strike, Farnese pulls Shirke out of the Maelstrom, and Zod arrives, it makes you wonder, especially reading these chapters back to back, if Miura might have done this in one chapter. I think there may be a few too many double spreads or full pages. The focus lingered just a little beyond the point being made that Guts isn't harming Griffith in the slightest, but again, for a first effort, I do think this is incredibly impressive. Never thought we would get this much in a million years. But as I say, there are weaknesses here. The artwork was done well, and some of those weaknesses were overcome with some great artistic decisions. I'm surprised how, overall, Griffith was actually drawn very, very well. Working on Duranki made for some interesting and suitably different looks for both Shiake and Farnese. It was a nice touch to have a serious Puck be witness to Zod's arrival, because it's been a long time since Miura has even given Puck a fully drawn panel to himself. So I'm holding out hope that perhaps other characters might shine a little here. The same goofiness given to Puck over the years was also handed to Azan, which is a shame because he has a great origin story as the Bridge Knight, and is in and of himself a great strong character all the way from the Conviction arc. The next chapter has Guts fighting Zod, and then the team decided to cut away from this, only to return with Guts attacking Griffith instead. It seems a bit disorganised in panelling. Griffith then retrieves the unconscious Casca, stopping Guts' swing. I find this to be artistically really neat, but story-wise I think I would have preferred Casca to be awake, or practically dying from how close she is to Griffith at this point. Yes, it does make a pretty picture, but the curse Griffith put on the two was an ugly one. I just feel like the picturesque quality and Casca being taken and asleep for it whilst in no pain whatsoever felt like a peculiar direction. In the cutaway, we saw both Isidro and Serpico, and it's very interesting to see their new drawing styles. It seems the female and the fantasy characters have come out of this the strongest, with Ivalera, Puck, Shierke, and all the creatures of Elfhelm, Danan, and Farnese practically remaining as they were. Danan senses something coming, sprouting from the earth. And just as Griffith takes Casca, the spring leaves of the spirit tree all die, and the ground beneath Guts' feet collapses, leaving Griffith near Zod with Casca in hand and separated from the section of land with Farnese and Shierke. Though, we didn't see them back off from Griffith. I think it's really a shame we didn't see that. Maybe the maelstrom advancing towards them became too much, but if you read just Griffith's sections, you'll see that Shierke and Farnese completely just disappear. They go from holding Casca and protecting her, to just not being there. It would have been a fascinating page to see them forced to abandon Casca, and it would have brought the page count to 16, a regular size. So there's a lot to chew on here. My main theory for the ending utilised the spirit trees and its connection to the astral world, so I am very keen to find out if this thing somehow just died. And it also stands that there's no logical way for the apostles to come from the ground without some kind of explanation once again deferring to the precedent of the spirit tree. Even if there is no adequate explanation story-wise, I do love the thematic resurgence of the blossoming tree wilting, because it calls back and wraps up the arc's chapter in a callback to Chich. With another three chapters left, we have everything sliding into place. We know Griffith is taking Casca, we know Guts is falling deep into the earth to fight whatever is springing forth, we know that Farnese and Shiake are practically helpless for the rest of this, but we do know that Danan is aware of Griffith, and I foresee that these three chapters will be interconnecting segments between Guts fighting that which lies below, and Danan, Jed, Skull Knight, and the others giving one last push against Griffith. Whatever comes of that will be interesting to see, because this might well be it from these guys now, with the island itself shattered, and the source of our main character's plight being moved once again back to Midland. It's such a surprise to see Berserk releasing like it did all of those years ago, because this video originally started as a reaction to the first chapter, and has since had to grow to accommodate the second, and now the third chapter. But anyway, the next chapter is August 12th, and I will be covering it per chapter, or will try to anyway, unless it gets away from me like this one has. It should have been obvious, but what's super interesting to observe is the fact that on top of the drawings, which, yeah, if you pull up real close, almost everything is done differently, but looking from the frontmost layer, we have simply identical effects. Studio Gaga, the team behind the effects for Miora's time on Berserk, are continuing with this. 
So it's strange but oddly soothing to see that regardless of some details and the change that's happened, the overall top layer of aesthetic has remained identical, in a way. Because of this, the covers themselves have this especially distinct appearance that has an aura just like the Berserk we knew, but with the characters drawn in an almost caricature of themselves, clothing and items like the Berserk armor and corpses, the backgrounds and everything but the characters are just like they were. And following through with past quotations from Miura, that's how their skills were tutored. Overall, I'd say they've done a good job. If anything, I think maybe they should have kept the next four chapters and beyond a secret, because I really didn't expect this level of quality and attempt at continuation whatsoever. The new Berserk is very much like a new series in a way, where there is now once again a long path ahead, both for the story and also for the growth in terms of panelling, dialogue and art. The colour page which came with the chapters also shows what may well be Volume 42's cover one day. It's a good illustration of this whole revival, with an aesthetic and design that's just like its predecessor, but when it comes to characters themselves, there's a clear difference. Guts has angular features that almost give off a cartoonish style. It reminds me a little bit of Castlevania, and with an open mind, I think it's a cool beginning for Studio Gaga's Berserk. I very much look forward to detailing what its artistic evolution looks like years from now. But as of today, that's all we have for the new Berserk. Thanks for watching, thank you to my patrons for supporting this video and every video, thanks everyone for watching, leave a like, comment and subscribe for more, and have a wonderful night.